Hi, it's Dwyer. DwyerCrime.blog, a crime blog I run. Also, RichardDwyer.com, my law firm site. Today is June the 8th, 2020. Let's talk about a very troubling case. I've always wondered what happens when you have a questionable witness. Someone who's prepared to say things under oath that are contradicted by the evidence and by others, right? And when you have an innocent person who, unfortunately, is involved in a tale that's so salacious, a set of facts that surround the murder, an argument made by the prosecution that sounds compelling, even if the argument has no factual basis whatsoever. I often wonder what happens in cases like that. Is it possible that even great shows like Forensic Files can portray the facts inaccurately in such a way to make an innocent man look guilty? Well, all of that happened in my opinion, and it's my opinion, right? First Amendment, we all have a right to our opinion. All of that happened in my opinion with regard to the murder of Vicki Barton, for which her husband, a police lieutenant, Jim Barton, was convicted and sentenced to 10 to 25 years based in part on the testimony of Gary Henson, a guy who has served jail time. In my opinion, this case is simply outrageous. Let me also add, too, that Barton, eventually after several years in prison, after he won his appeal of the district court's denial of his petition for habeas corpus, Barton eventually accepted a deal, an Alfred deal, to stay out of prison. Right? They allowed him to accept a deal after he spent something like 10 years in prison, several years in prison, where he said, okay, I maintain I'm innocent, but I'll concede that the state has enough evidence to convict me. That's why he's out of prison today. Well, just to understand, I'm even going to question the plea. I don't think the state had enough evidence to convict him. In fact, let's go further. All of us should be concerned when the criminal justice system fails as miserably as it did in this case. On April the 11th, 1995, Police Lieutenant Thomas Barton, known as Jim Barton, returns home and finds his wife on the floor, undressed, not breathing, with three bullet holes in her head. She has been raped and murdered, right? This is right outside Springfield, Ohio. Now, he's cleared. The murder, again, happens April 11th, 1995. The evidence shows that Barton wasn't home when his wife was raped and murdered. Right? So he's cleared. Three years pass. In 1998, Gary Henson, who was in jail at the time of the murder, is caught by police 
for an unrelated burglary. Henson then tells the police in an effort to reduce whatever punishment he is to receive that he has information about the Vicki Mark Barton murder from 1995, three years earlier. Henson claims that his half-brother, who of course is dead at the time, Henson tells the story, was romantically involved with Vicky. So the half-brother, a guy named William Phelps, then decided that he was going to rob Vicky's house when Vicky was not there. So, he breaks into the house. Guess what? Vicky's there. William Phelps panics, right? Phelps, of course, can't tell the story himself because months after this allegedly took place, Phelps commits suicide. Phelps panics. He rapes and kills Vicky Barton, and then he leaves. Right? Henson goes on to say that his brother's suicide four months after Vicky's death may have been caused by his grief over having killed Vicky Barton. Now keep in mind, this is simply a guy arrested for burglary trying to pin this murder on his dead half-brother. Gary Henson at the time does not make any statements, any statements whatsoever, of Vicky's husband being involved in this. Rather, his half-brother is supposed to have been romantically involved with Vicky Barton. So, more than seven years in fact, let me, let me back up a bit. So armed with this information, the police decide to be diligent. They exhume the body of William Phelps. Right? They take it out of the cemetery. And they do a DNA analysis. They take Phelps's DNA. And then they compare it to the DNA found at the crime scene. It is not a match. Right? It is not a match. There's no DNA evidence that William Phelps, right, who's dead as the police investigate this, raped and murdered. Vicki Barton. That should have been the end of the case. Believe it or not, it is not. So seven years after the murder, in fact, it's almost eight years after the murder, in April of 2003, a cold case squad is reviewing the 911 call that Jim Barton made when he found his wife's body. In that call, Barton, who's emotional, he's just found his wife. She's nude and she's dead and she's been shot. Right? In that 911 call, he says, I need to get, excuse me, I need to call Felt, man. Right? That's what he says. I need to call Felt, man. So then, of course, the cold case squad reaches the conclusion that Barton is referring to William Phelps, the guy whose DNA did not match the crime scene. Right? Barton claims he was saying, I need to call for help. In the Forensic Files episode on this crime, 
the voice analysts that they bring in who plays and replays and replays the tape, who looks at the sound waves from that 911 call, reaches the conclusion that Barton is saying, I need to call Phelp, man. Right? Barton is referring to William Phelps. The police also make the point that if Barton is on a 911 call, he's already on the phone with people who can help him. So why would he say, I need to call for help when he's already on the phone with help? So here's where the case, in my opinion, just gets even more preposterous. So the police at this point reach out to Gary Henson again. You remember him. He was the guy who was in jail, who later gets arrested for an unrelated burglary. And he has a tale that his dead half-brother was romantically involved with Vicki Phelps and that he was there to rob the house. Vicki was home. He panics, so he rapes and kills her. Right? Apparently panics to the point where he shoots her three times with a twenty-two. Right? According to the evidence. Um, Vicky is shot three times with a twenty-two caliber gun. So, of course, the police, after re-listening to the 911 audio, they interview Gary Henson again. And Henson's story changes. Right? Again, this is roughly eight years after the murder. This time, Gary claims that his half-brother was paid by Jim Barton to kill Barton's wife. Right? Again, eight years after the murder. The police lieutenant is supposed to have paid $3,000 to Gary Henson's now dead half brother to kill his wife. According to this news story, and keep in mind, this is the first the police are hearing of it, even though they've interviewed Henson in the past. Henson was supposed to help his half brother do the crime, but Henson was in jail at the time. So the brother recruits an unidentified accomplice, right? This is the first time in Henson's telling and retelling of the story that there is now someone else, an unidentified accomplice. And of course, you know what happened. It's the unidentified accomplice who supposedly shoots Vicki Barton. Right? The half-brother and the unidentified accomplice break into the house, having been paid, allegedly, by Jim Barton to kill his wife. And it's the unidentified accomplice who does that. That's the story, believe it or not, that the prosecution goes with at trial, and incredibly, they get a conviction. Barton is sentenced to 10 to 25 years for involuntary manslaughter, as well as aggravated burglary. Now understand how ridiculous this case is, and it is absolutely ridiculous. There is no DNA linking Phelps to the crime. The cops can't <coughs> piece together any portion of Gary Henson's story. 
right? Because Phelps is dead. The DNA does not match. Gary Henson, who was in prison when the crime was committed, can't give a name for the unidentified accomplice who supposedly shoots Vicky. There's no explanation as to why the men, if they were paid by Jim Barton to kill his wife, would decide to rape her. Right? Possibly leaving DNA that could link back to them. Also, in analyzing the 911 call, the police act as if a husband who finds his wife murdered, shot three times, nude, raped, wouldn't be excited, wouldn't be rambling on the phone. If you've just found your wife dead, is it that much of a reach to believe that you would say, I need to call for help, man? Right? They have no evidence whatsoever, none, that Lieutenant Jim Barton knew William Phelps, that the two men talked at any time. None whatsoever. So, believe it or not, the prosecution theory with regard to the motive of the crime is that Jim Barton, who was in his 40s, wanted to become police chief. But he and his wife lived outside of city limits. And that job normally went to someone who lived in the city. So, with no evidence, the prosecution makes the argument, just based on Jim's career position as a highly thought of police lieutenant, that he hired Phelps to scare his wife into wanting to move out of the house and to move to the city, to enhance Barton's opportunity to become police chief. Folks, there is no evidence for any of that. It makes for a compelling forensic files. And it's an old forensic files. Right? It sounds compelling. I can imagine a jury falling in love with that story. That story is a good one. You say, what would lead a guy who loves his wife who's been married to her for years to suddenly hire someone to kill her. Then suddenly this story comes along. And you say to yourself, oh, okay, well, maybe this guy, who was an excellent lieutenant, was so involved with his career that he was willing to have people scare his wife. And of course, the crooks ended up killing her and raping her. Well, let me tell you how preposterous the whole thing is. After he's convicted on such sketchy evidence, if you want to call it that, understand, Gary Hansen, the guy arrested for burglary who claims to know something about this case hasn't been in the Barton house. <laughs> He's claiming his stepbrother did this. His stories are so internally inconsistent. One minute, his half-brother rather, one minute his half-brother was romantically involved with Vicky. Now we're hearing, years after the crime, that no, he was paid to kill her. Right? One minute we're hearing, oh, he panics. She's home. He wasn't expecting it. So he rapes and kills her. To later hearing that, no, he's not even the shooter. He's there on a murder for hire. 
right? There are no witnesses of Barton ever paying or even knowing William Phelps, right? But he's there on a murder for hire with someone else. In other words, he's gone from a suicide guy racked with grief in the initial version of the story who was having an affair and ends up killing the person he was having the affair with. He goes from that to later being a hitman willing to kill for money who goes over there not by himself. He's not visiting an ex-lover or going to rob her place. Robbery is not even the motive. Instead, he's over there with someone else. And they kill her and rape her. So Gary Henson, forgive me, is inconsistent at a minimum, isn't he? The police at trial also point out that the burglary at the Barton residence looks staged. So understand, looking at this evidence, Barton gets sentenced. He's found guilty, gets sentenced. Then it goes to a district court, a federal court, on a writ of habeas corpus. And the court denies the writ. So Barton remains in prison. So what then happens is it gets appealed to the United States Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit. That's where I'm getting my facts here today. What I'm going to do in the comment section of the YouTube video. And I know I put these on iTunes as well and Google Podcasts. Let me just point out that on YouTube, my account is Esquire777. The name of the channel is The Wire Crime Channel. What I'm going to do in the comment section of the YouTube video is I'm going to leave a link to the United States Court of Appeals Sixth Circuit decision in this case. So you can read this for yourself and realize how our criminal justice system failed this man. Well, this story has a wrinkle, and it's actually the wrinkle that freed Jim Barton. That made the prosecution then offer him a plea that was pretty much for time served, plus a little probation outside of prison. Well, understand, Gary Henson privately told prosecutors in the case that he had been hired before to stage a burglary. Now, understand how factually inconsistent this is. Gary Henson isn't claiming to have ever been at the Barton residence. His initial story has his half-brother. His later story has a half-brother and an unidentified accomplice. But, of course, Gary is chatty. And Gary apparently tells the prosecution that, yeah, this burglary looks staged because he had been hired before to stage a burglary. He even gives the name of the person who hired him, a Mr. Kelly. Right Now, there was a burglary of the Kelly residence, and of course, the police suspected that that burglary was staged. So understand what happened, right? The burglary was nearby, the Barton residence. So, the police leaned heavily on Mr. Kelly to admit that he had hired Gary Henson, right, the source of most of their information, to stage a burglary at his residence. They even threatened to bring charges against Mr. Kelly. And Mr. Kelly flatly told the police, no, I never hired Gary Henson to stage any kind of burglary at my residence. Right, the police could find nothing. Nothing. 
that connected Hansen to Kelly. And of course, the prosecution, knowing that their star witness had a version of events involving Mr. Kelly that was contradicted by the Kelly family, Mr. Kelly and Ann Kelly. The prosecution did not provide this information to former police Lieutenant Barton's attorneys. So Barton went into court and Barton made the claim that this was a clear-cut Brady violation. Right prosecutions are obligated to give exculpatory evidence to a criminal defendant. And here, they did not. So based on inconsistent testimony from Gary Henson, a man who was not at the scene, who blamed the murder on his dead half-brother, based on expert witness testimony that immediately after finding his wife shot to death in the 911 call Jim Barton said I need to call for help man according to the prosecution I need to call felt man right based on that expert witness testimony and based on what I believe was speculation about a possible motive, right? The fact that Jim Barton was someone with a successful police career, so how do we come up with a motive as to why he would hire someone, even though we don't have evidence of that? At least not evidence from a consistent witness that he would hire someone to kill the wife he loved. Well, according to the prosecution, not to kill her, even though that's what happened, but to scare her, right? Scare her into moving to the city to increase the chances of a promotion for him. Right, based on that sketchy evidence, without telling the defense, that Henson was making claims about staging a burglary for someone, a nearby neighbor, who claimed he'd never hired Henson to stage a burglary, that his house was legitimately burglarized, <laughs> right? Based on all of that, the Sixth Circuit made the decision to allow Jim Barton out of prison to require the state to have to retry him. That's when the state came up with the idea that if he accepted an offered plea, that he'd be able to stay out of prison. Unfortunately, this happens far too much. We're seeing it in the West Memphis Three case. This happens far too much in American jurisprudence. Let me just say shame on the prosecutor in this case. You mean to tell me that some guy who by his own admission was in prison at the time that this crime took place comes up with some half-baked story that a dead half-brother did this crime. You do a DNA analysis and the DNA does not match. And you mean to tell me that you're then going to go forward and prosecute the husband who was not there when his wife of several years got killed? Shame on the prosecution. This shows you, too, how at risk all of us are. At the mercy of People like Gary Henson, who want to cut deals with police, right? Let's remember, Henson's arrested on an unrelated burglary. It shows you, too, how much at risk we are. 
when prosecutors can use the professional careers that we've built over the years. In this case, the guy was a police lieutenant against us at trial by making the claim that we hired people to hurt loved ones to maximize our career opportunities. This case also shows, and to me this is equally important, how fooled an excellent crime channel like HLN, who broadcasts forensic files, can be by a story that sounds salacious, that has interesting moments where they're analyzing a 911 call. Did he say for help or did he say I need to call felt, man? Right, it makes for riveting forensic files. It fits into the narrative of their story of technology helping crack crimes. The only problem was it wasn't true. I know by the time the forensic file show was made, a jury had already found 